Uh, turn with me in the Gospel of Luke. We are going to finish chapter 14 and get into chapter 15 today. We're plugging right along. So we start at Luke 14, verse 25, and go through uh, 15, verse 10. Now great crowds accompanied him, Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man begin to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 remind us that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be a complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Almighty, eternal, and merciful God, Your Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Open and illuminate our hearts and minds this morning with Your Spirit that we may better understand Your Word and that we may conform our lives to what we've understood. In the great saving name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Tom Lynn is the president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. You may have heard of that parachurch ministry. Uh, his life story goes something like this. He says, I performed well in high school, garnered accolades for athletics and leadership. I was my class valedictorian and named one of the top 20 high school students in the nation by USA Today. I was even featured in an ESPN television special. And then came the highest honor any Taiwanese parent can imagine, the Harvard acceptance letter. My future was secured. I was the model minority. But when I arrived at Harvard, I heard Jesus' call to follow Him in a new way. In a Bible study on Mark chapter 10, I sensed the Lord say to me, I have a mission for you, Tom. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. I cannot dis 
describe the pain and disappointment on my parents' faces when I told them I had decided to walk away from job opportunities with six-figure starting salaries to begin fundraising with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. My parents were devastated. We talked, argued, and wept for several days. Finally, seeing my resolve, they got down on their knees and begged me with their palms open, Tom, our lives are in the palms of your hands. Please don't crush us. My mom's last words of the conversation were, if you do this, I will kill myself. My parents, who I loved dearly, stopped communicating with me. It was painful. My phone calls went unanswered. My letters received no reply. Both of my parents entered into a severe depression and would not speak to me. They stopped going to church and withdrew from their own community of friends. My parents' silence and withdrawal lasted for years. Tom went into ministry. And there was silence from his parents. But many years later, he said that his mother got stomach cancer. And the Lord used that to reconcile not only their relationship, but their parents' spiritual lives and their other relationships, particularly with the church. Eventually, his mother sat him down and said, Tommy, there's something I've been wanting to say to you for a long time. I'm so sorry. I know that I caused you so much pain in the past few years. I should have supported you and just loved you. I love you, Tommy. And he apologized for his side to any pain that he caused too. Later, he said that he and his wife told his parents about their plans to start a Christian fellowship in Mongolia. And they were so afraid that his parents would be angry again. But this time, his parents supported him and encouraged him to go. Well, in today's passage, we've already read, Jesus made that startling, jarring statement that if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, he cannot be my disciple. While we don't understand why Jesus would ever tell us to hate someone, perhaps we can get a start with Tom Lin's story. In getting a feel for how putting God and His kingdom first in your life might make it feel like you are hating your family. We'll dive deeper into that area as well as a few other areas of discipleship that Jesus calls us to. I have three easy points as we work through what's not the easiest text. It's a challenging text, but here are the easy points. Carry your cross count the cost, and seek the lost. So let's start with the first one. Carry your cross. Let me read the first three verses again. 25 through 27. Now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What is Jesus doing throwing aside the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother? And Paul's commands for husbands to love their wives. And what is should be obvious throughout Scripture that we should love our families. I grew up in a nice Christian family, and if we ever said, I hate so-and-so, we were quickly corrected. We don't hate anyone except Satan. We grew up like that. What are we weren't supposed to say? We hate it. And then, then we read that Jesus wants us to hate our parents, hate my wife, hate my kids. So I don't think I can do that for you, Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus is not thinking so much of the fifth commandment here as He is about the first commandment. You shall have no other gods 
before me. Now we know that Jesus often made his point by hyperbole, exaggeration. So we have things like Matthew 19, 24. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, right? I imagine Jesus kind of as he's teaching, just looking around and sees a camel. It's kind of the largest thing in sight. And then maybe saw a needle. Maybe already had formulated that. But he said, just to get across his point, how ridiculous and crazy and hard that would be. But then, of course, he winks at the crowd and says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So here, Jesus is making his point so strongly, I don't think he's saying, hate your family. Yell at them. Run away from them. I mean, we're not there. Of course not. That goes against the rest of the teaching of Scripture. But compared to our love for Him, our love for our family might feel like hate. Again, Tom Lynn's story. But here's how the New Living Translation has phrased it. Similarly, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. All other relationships need to take a lower priority than our commitment to Him. If we place anything higher than Him, what have they become? They become idols or gods. And again, no other gods before me. Jesus is not just asking for our preference. He's not asking for a vote of confidence. He's not hoping that He'll have some bandwagon jumping fans. Jesus wants disciples. Hardcore, come hell or high water, allegiance. And He demands absolute loyalty. In my first sermon at Center Point Church, way back, almost two years ago when everything shut down. My first sermon preaching to my phone and uploading. Uh, I preached on the parallel passage to this in Matthew about carrying your cross. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that this morning. You can find that on our website if you want to dive deeper into that. It's a little different uh, text, but it's a similar thought. I do want to say, though, that we often... I don't know if you've heard this or said something like it. We, we, we can throw that phrase around somewhat uh, easily. Carrying your cross. My cross to bear. So like if a man doesn't like his job, but he has to keep doing it, that's his cross to bear. Or if a woman has a husband who isn't very loving and doesn't help with the kids, maybe she says, that's my cross to bear. Or a chronic illness, someone feels like that's my cross to bear. And I don't want to minimize those things. Those are all difficult things that the Lord will give you strength to bear up under. But that's not carrying your cross. That's not those things. But carrying your cross is being ready to die for Him. Jesus was saying you have to be willing to walk step by step with Him through His sufferings. I'm giving up my life for this mission, He says. Are you willing to do the same? Are you willing to surrender to God's will? And if necessary, feel His shame and suffering too? We die to our own plans, our own ambitions, our own agendas to serve where He directs us. That that doesn't mean everybody becomes a missionary and a pastor. I don't mean that at all. But we follow Him no matter what. Ready to die if we're called to it. Hard words. Before we start down that road of discipleship, though, Jesus advises us to count the cost. That's our second point. Counting the cost. Let's read again verses 28 through 35. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. 
So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Following Jesus is deeply rewarding and connects us with our Creator and loving Heavenly Father. But it is not easy. I hope that no one has ever told you that the Christian life was a walk in the park. Jesus Himself didn't sugarcoat the requirements and the hardships that would be in store for those who decided to be His disciples. He wanted those who responded to Him in faith to know what they were getting into. Because opposition and difficulties would come. And you can't say you haven't been warned. You don't have to read the fine print with Jesus. He usually just tells you straight out. And He does here. What you're signing up for. He told us that we need to think through whether we are willing to accept His terms. And His terms are sacrifice. Surrender to Him. Every great thing you do in life is going to require sacrifice. And following Jesus is that as well. Every Christian needs to know there will be a high cost so that when things get rough, you won't be tempted to turn back. So Jesus gives the example, two examples. One of a man building a tower and then of a king going to war. Both need to know that they can follow through what they started. It shouldn't even begin, right? Right? Just imagine the half-built tower, or the tower that only has the foundation. He says, Jesus says, that's, that's just going to open the owner, the builder, to mockery. And then the army that can't win a battle should know not to even march out. They should per- ask for peace instead. And Jesus wasn't counseling for or against war, merely giving us a picture of how hard we should weigh our commitments before we jump into them. Now, many of you know I lay out my sermon text months ahead of time. So the fact that I was preaching on this the week that Russia invaded the Ukraine, it was just amazing timing. Um, and, and apparently... Putin has considered the cost of this invasion and and decided it's worth risking everything he's built up and alienating, provoking the rest of the world. And the Ukrainians have counted the cost and decided it's worth it to stay and fight. And now, other world leaders will need to weigh on whether they will join in or not. Let's... Just keep praying for them. This is a sidebar. This isn't the main point of what Jesus is saying, but I just urge you, pray for wisdom, protection, and a quick resolution to this conflict. Verses 34 and 35, the teaching about salt, losing its saltiness. It's aimed at the disciple who thinks that he or she can go halfway in. That he can commit some of his areas of his life to Jesus, but hold back a lot and follow the, way, the world's ways in other areas. Because verse 33 says you have to renounce everything. Be willing to walk away from anything tying you down, keeping you from pursuing Jesus wholeheartedly. The only thing that makes salt lose its saltiness is when it's mixed with other things that makes it bland and tasteless. If you're willing to commit your whole life to Jesus, you have, if you're not willing to commit your whole life to Jesus, you have diluted your saltiness. You will not be a very effective witness in the world. Again, Jesus calling us all the way in. Let's move into chapter 15 and see one more way that disciples can reflect the heart of Jesus to seek the lost. The first ten verses, let's read those again. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. 
So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek it diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repent. Both of these stories, these parables, start with loss. One loss seems insignificant in the grand scheme of things, right? It's one sheep out of 99. Most people probably could live losing one out of the hundred sheep. The other loss seems much more substantial. In in one sense, it's just a coin, but in another sense, it's one-tenth of this woman's wealth. I think we'd all get up off the couch and search our houses high and low for a tenth of our wealth. I think the point is that whether what got lost is substantial or not, it doesn't matter to Jesus. It's time to find it. Because to Jesus, every soul is precious beyond measure. And so both the shepherd and the woman go to great troubles to find what was lost. And they both call their friends and neighbors together to rejoice with them. They have such delight in recovery. And Jesus says, this is a picture of your heavenly Father. This is God. He seeks out lost sinners And then he gathers the angels around and says, Rejoice with me, for this lost sinner has been found. It's not that God ever loses someone in the sense that he misplaces them, but we are lost in sin, found in Christ, and brought back to God through repentance. Also hear this story. This story of the lost sheep was a rebuke of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day. Why? Well, they were the shepherds of Israel, right? And how much did they care about any of those who were lost? Well, you can hear how much they care. It's summed up in verse 2 that they were grumbling that Jesus was receiving sinners and eating with them. The lost sinners in their midst, in their minds, were the low down, the dirty, those who were unworthy of their time and attention. If the Pharisees got too close and ate with them, then they would be unclean and corrupted. Right? In their minds, the sheep should rescue themselves. It was their fault they were lost in the first place. But of course, that is not how Jesus saw them. Jesus saw them as fallen sinners in need of love and grace who would be cause for celebration when they were found and brought into the light of God's grace. This was unimaginable, unthinkable to the Pharisees and the scribes. It's one thing to say that God would receive a repentant sinner. It's another thing to say that He would go seek them out. Those are two very different things, right? Because one, you're saying, well, God will sit back and say someday they'll realize how lost they are. They'll clean themselves up and then they'll come back to me and I guess I'll take them back. Why not? And the Pharisees would probably add, make sure you make them grovel a lot. Make sure they know how wretched they've acted. That's not the heart of our God. God has been called the hound of heaven by the poet Francis Thompson. 
He pursues lost souls to bring them home safely. Not to grind their nose in their sinfulness, but to adopt them and to restore them. In our natural states, we are spiritually dead. Romans 3 says, no one seeks for God. So He comes for us. Later in Luke 19.10, we'll hear that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. John 10.11, Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. And 1 Peter 2.24-25 spells it out even more that He, Jesus, bore our sins in His body on the tree. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds we have been healed. For you were straying like sheep. There's that sheep metaphor again. And have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus both lived His human life and then died on a cross as a rescue mission to find and to claim His sheep. He died for the hundred, for what we call the invisible church, all who will come to faith in Him. But don't forget that He also died for each individual soul, each precious lost sheep. Because He had lived a perfect life, His death was counted by God as the sacrifice that would pay the penalty of death for our sin. As 1 Peter 2 said, His wounds heal us. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we can be found and redeemed, given eternal life with our Creator God. One last idea here. Uh, Kenneth Bailey is a scholar who wrote a book called The Cross and the Prodigal, Luke 15, Through the Eyes of Middle Eastern Peasants. I'm probably going to quote from that next week when we study the prodigal son. And he says in that book about Jesus' discussion of the man who goes after the one sheep, he tells us that not only is that wonderful for the one sheep, but it's reassuring. It's good news for the 99 other sheep. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. This might be a very familiar parable, but look at it from that. It is, here's what he says. It's the shepherd's willingness to go after the one that gives the 99 their real security. If the one is sacrificed in the name of the larger good of the group, then each individual in the group is insecure. He knows that he also is of little value. If lost, he will be left to die. When the shepherd pays a high price to find the one, he thereby offers the profoundest security to the many. We have a shepherd who loves his sheep so deeply that he goes to any length to reclaim them. The sheep who are defenseless, helpless out in the wilderness, vulnerable to predators, weather, he comes. We can rest and rejoice in his love and wonderful care for each one of us, knowing that he loves us that intensely as well. C.S. Lewis, as you probably know, was a professor of classics at Oxford University. He was a man who devoted his whole life to reading and understanding the great works of literature, and he produced some of those himself. Here's what he said about literature in general. The Christian will take literature a little less seriously than the cultured pagan. Because the Christian knows from the outset that the salvation of a single soul is more important than the production or preservation of all the epics and tragedies in the world. I love that quote. And coming from him, that's quite a statement from an academic and a bookworm. right? One person's salvation is more important than the entire Library of Congress. How much value do we put on one lost soul, one lost sheep? I'm sure that most, if not all of us here, would say, yeah, yeah, we, I highly value every lost soul. And yet, how often do our 
lives say that. I know my life doesn't really scream that very often. I have a hard time saying, hey, look at my life. Look how much I share Jesus with lost people. Look how concerned I am. Because it can be a real struggle. If there's someone here who's doing that great, I would love to find out how you do it. There's a man named Shabu. Uh, Some of us went to his evangelism seminar. And uh, I learned a lot there. But I also get his email newsletter. And every Thursday night, he goes out somewhere in downtown Philadelphia and brings gospel tracts and and tries to initiate conversations with people to lead them to faith in Jesus. It's awesome work. (laughs) It's very intimidating. Um, That's like a nightmare for introverts. Right? I don't know if that's your style. I've, I've tried things like that. I used to sit at a, a mall food court and just try to talk to people and share the gospel with them like that. I've, I've shared my faith with people on planes, sit next to them, and it's always a little uncomfortable and often discouraging. Our great prayer, though, is that seeds get sown in any conversation we have like that and that God will continue to water them and bring them to fruition. But I'm going to assume that most of us are not real comfortable with that style of evangelism. I hope you'll try it at least. But think about it. But many of us try long-term relational evangelism. That's wonderful too. We cultivate relationships with our neighbors, our fellow students, our co-workers, people with common interests. And as we share our lives, as they get to know us, as they trust us, hopefully we can open up about the most important thing in our lives. I was once part of a basketball rec league, and I I love to play basketball, but even more, I tried to make it a place where I could meet unbelievers and, and then invite them out to breakfast and eventually share my faith. And I did that with board games, too. There was a kind of a board game group at the local library, and I went hoping to share my faith with people that were unchurched. And it's hard work. We try to have our neighbors over and engage them, get to know them. Every house we've lived in, we've we've tried to use it as a ministry house. But long-term evangelism can be so hard. We've had people move away and people distance themselves. But it is worth Investing. It is worth having a heart for the lost to model Jesus in that way. The bottom line is that we have a God who searched for us, who sent His Son in the form of a human being to seek and to save the lost, which was you, which was me. His heart to reclaim and rejoice over the lost soul is just a beautiful picture of His love for His people. It's easy to drift into somewhat callous indifference. And we end up looking a little more like the Pharisees than we'd really like to. Let's join God in His rescue mission and look for ways that we can seek and share Jesus with the lost. I mean, it can be overwhelming. I would say just start with one person. Just Pick one person and pray unceasingly for that one person. And then look for opportunities to speak into their lives. To do things with them. Pray that God would surround them with other believers. As you do that, God is faithful. Jesus, know that He is the great shepherd who will draw His sheep into the fold. Our efforts are never wasted. When we do that, we are true salt in this world, not in danger of losing our saltiness. We become His hands and feet, disciples who have counted the hard road of following Jesus. It is worth it for those lost souls. Leave the 99, find the one. Let's pray. Amen. Lord God, thank you for these texts.
Thank you for Luke's careful recording of Jesus' life and teachings. And everyone probably would like a much lower bar to follow, to be a disciple. But thank you for the reminder that Jesus calls us to be all in, to be fully committed, wholehearted, not holding back. Lord, we know you want us to love our families, but they are second, third priorities. Our own lives, our own agendas, we need to line them up behind your priorities. God, give us hearts that have counted that cost and are ready to do that. And give us a passion and a love for those who are lost. Show us ways in whatever context we're in, whatever work situation, our neighborhoods, wherever we are, there will be unchurched, lost folks that need to hear the amazing gospel of Jesus. So give us wisdom and courage for how to reach them. And we pray that you turn their hearts, use our efforts, but your Holy Spirit has to do the work. So guide us and sustain us through that. We ask all these things in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and close with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. Amen. Receive the benediction from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Come as you are. Grow in grace and truth. And then go, as Jesus said. Amen.